symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hello and welcome to Arn. This is Paul Bromwell, and today I'm joined by the Hall of Famer, the founder of the Four Horsemen, the creator of the Spinebuster, one of the best tag team wrestlers in the history of the business. And you guys know I'm not joking. I'm dead serious when I say that. You've seen him in action. You've seen the Spine Busters. And as we found out last week, while he doesn't understand scissoring, I get it. Because 270 pounds of Billy Gunn does it. It's okay, ladies and gentlemen. He's the enforcer. He's double A. He's Arn Anderson. Arn, how are you this week, man? If you've been in a room with Billy Gunn and you see those veins of his starting mm. to pop out just from walking around, whatever he wants to do is fine with me. But he, he is a specimen, and I don't know if you got to catch the show uh, this past week, but it was his birthday. I did. And uh, they did a big uh, celebration for, for Billy Gunn. But he it looks incredible. He's the biggest guy in the company. Woo. You know, the of the active wrestlers, I mean, the guy, it just keeps continuing to get bigger and more vascular and more muscular. It's ridiculous. He's ripped. He's rock solid. He's 59? Yeah, I mean, approaching his 60s real close, and wow. it's just incredible the shape that he's in, and no major injuries. And uh, I've heard Tony talk about it before, Shivani, that is. The guy's real you know, careful about what he eats. Um, I don't oh, know what that's about. but He yeah. lives the life, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. the diet and the, the training, and yeah. it all comes first. He's all schwoped up. He's something else. And, man, he's now over again. You know, Daddy Ass is over again with a, with another tag team, so it's fun to see. But, listen, you and I have a lot to cover, so I don't want to delay the point. But we got some big events coming up with you that I want to get to. But we got to start with a little football. And, buddy, Saturday, as this drops on the main feed, probably the biggest regular season college football so far this year is happening, and that's your boys, the Georgia Bulldogs, taking on the Tennessee Volunteers. Arn, what do you think about this big one? Terrified. Oh, okay. Brother, hey, you know, Tennessee's for real. It's been a while, but they are this year, man. They are for real, you know, and Georgia's got a good team, but, you know, it's... I, I, there are these certain, as you know, you fo you know follow college football. There are these teams of destiny that get on a roll, and it doesn't matter what happens. You know, this is their year, and I'm scared. This is their year because everything's going good. Now, if they beat Alabama and threw their goalposts in the river, yeah, what's going to happen? Which is, uh, I'm going to need a little counseling to figure that one out. What are they going to do if they were to beat Georgia, the I, national champions? I, I can't even imagine, and and that, and you know that's guaranteed number one in the country, and they're you know well positioned for the as a national title favorite. I wish we had some advertising on that show, don't you? Oh hell yeah! L let me let me tell you something. Have you ever watched a game? I'm sure you have. Have you been to a game before at Neyland Stadium? Uh, yeah, I've been to Georgia Stadium. Yeah. Have between, you, have the hedge, you, between the hedges, not at Tennessee. Have you been to Tennessee? Okay, no. so that that I've been to one game there. It was against Florida, and it was back when um, when the, uh, Tennessee actually came back and won. They had Josh uh, Josh Dobbs as their quarterback, and it was a comeback game. And it was the first time in eleven years they won. Arn, it was so loud. I've never been to a game where me and my best friend are sitting beside each other and we're screaming at each other and still can't hear each other. Unbelievable. Well it's, like, well, it's like Michigan Stadium. It's like 105,000 people or something, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's just sheer numbers, sheer mass, and they're all going to be orange. I don't think you're going to see very many red jerseys. No, no. It's going to be it's going to be uh, bananas. It's going to be off the rails. It's going to be fun, Arn. I know you'll be watching, and uh, we all will, and it's going to be fun. Got to love this type of this time of the year, man, between football and football. And at a college and NFL, Christian McCaffrey's been traded to the 49ers. He's running, catching, throwing touchdowns. So you're not happy there. Okay. We better. Yeah. Move on. I mean, hey, it's when you miss two field goals. I don't like to blame stuff on the field goal kickers. Yeah. Because most times it's, hey, if you'd have got out and scored some touchdowns, he wouldn't have been in a position to kick all those attempted field goals. But man, when the the game is on the line like that and you miss two, 
and you're a team that's struggling, and you that would have been something, you know, to to dig you out of the quagmire you've been living in. I got, I'm a huge Panthers fan. I mean, I'm I like to pull for them, but damn. Hey, listen, both of us. You you like your Panthers? I like my Steelers. And uh, man, there'll be better seasons ahead for both those franchises. So that's that. I hey, still enjoy watching. I do. I'm still watching it. Hey, by the way, this coming game on the fifth, November fifth, that's at that's in Athens. So you don't have to worry about Tennessee ripping down their goalposts because they don't, they don't play again till November 18th, and that one's in Knoxville. So there you oh, go. Oh, so I'm um, well. You know what? I'm not that plugged in, am I? I That's know okay. That. That's all right. That's what I'm here for. You know, live research on the on the fly like that. You know. So uh, we're you're, good. You are the knowledge man. <laughs> Speaking of dropping some knowledge, Arn, I want to make sure our fans are aware of where they can check out you and Brock. November 12th and 13th, you guys are going to be at the Indie Fanboy Expo Comic Con, right? That's a Saturday and Sunday. Yep, Indianapolis, Indiana, we sure are. And uh, I love doing these. You know, I love being able to shake hands and thank the, you know, all the fans that have made these, all these things that, that we are so blessed, our family, to have. Um, they're responsible for it and I like to let them each and every one of them know and uh, I always ask about what do they feel about you and I you always get a thumbs up oh okay may have to give you like a full time job what do you think (sighs) That's, you know what? Like, like maybe what? Like full time on co-host. The co-host. Holy shit! Wow. Well, you do all the work. Well, you got all the knowledge. All you got I all the stories, is, brother. That's what they're here for. I just sit here and act like a dipshit and hope somebody <laughs>, laughs. Somebody has a break in their day. Yep. All the aggravation that that they're suffering with. That maybe we just give them a break. Maybe that's my job. Hey, speaking of uh, you know just having fun and, and getting out and seeing people. I got to see a couple people that you work with this past week in Baltimore. I was down there for a AEW Heels event, raising money for breast cancer. I got to see the doctor, Britt Baker. I saw Rebel, and I saw Wardlow. Uh, man, that kid is a big badass. <laughs> yes. uh, and you know what? I'll I tell you how I gauge the, the real badasses. He's silent. Mm. He just walks the halls. He smiles. He speaks. He's a uh, he's a class act, and he, you know you never see him getting loud or showing his ass or barking. He's one of those guys that you're glad to have on the crew. He's the real deal. Bright future for that guy, Arn. Yes, he's a young man with a very bright future. There you go. And and is he the type that's a, that listens to you? Like, is he is he a good listener? Is like coming to the veterans and? I've only had a couple of conversations with him, and. They turned out very well. He was very receptive to what we were talking about. And, you know, that's all you can do. All you can do is suggest, right? Speaking of uh, Wardlow, who's from Ohio, when you're in town on the 12th and 13th, how about this for a transition? You're going to Dayton, Ohio on the 12th, the Pro Wrestling Revolver. That night, you and Brock are hopping in the car on the 12th, that Saturday. You're going to drive up to Pro Wrestling Revolver and do a signing there in Dayton. For those fans before making your way back on the 13th so shout out to pro wrestling revolver and the fans there arn and brock are coming to see you too it's going to be a hell of a card now don't ever say that i'm not dedicated signing for six or seven hours jumping right in the car taking off to dayton when the show's over doubling right back down to indy and getting up early enough to go to the gym and shower up and be at the signing that morning sunday morning at 10 a.m that's dedication for an older guy now hey buddy this is like throwback to the old horseman traveling days you and tully up and down the roads with a schedule like that got to get up and sweat man that's (laughs) key to everything body feels a hell of a lot better you get up and sweat and you don't if you don't move it like they say you lose it right arn and you got to just keep (laughs) moving well, you're going to lose it anyway, but I'm just trying to slow down the uh, volume and uh, <sighs> the quickness of it. And, and what you do lose, you can make up for in Blue Chew, but we'll get to that ad later. Um, so. Oh, no, no, not yet. <laughs> L- let me get into the, this sport, this cast first. Let, let, let's keep going because we got a lot here. Okay, then well, another big news, le- more big news, more big news. Kickstarter announced. Arn's brand new comic book, guys. This is fantastic. You can find it arncomic.com, November 15th. Arn, how excited are you for your story to be told 
in comic book style. I mean, Tony Schiavone's was a huge hit, and now this is your opportunity, my friend. Well, you know, the time just never seemed right. I was working all the time and had a full time career, and it just didn't feel right to because it's it's a a slash autobiography slash comic book. It's a little of both. It's not just completely one or the other. Um, but it's got a lot of details about my life that most people won't won't know, and when they hear it, they'll go, God. That's my that's my situation. That was mm. that's what happened to me. And these are not necessarily all happy situations. Some of them are. Some of them aren't. Some of them, you know, you, most people are going to go scratch their head and go, God Almighty, I didn't know that. So there's a it's going to be an interesting read. Uh, people over the last twenty five years have said, "When well, you going to write another book?" And I just said, I, "I don't think I will." This opportunity came up, Source Point Press, good people. They do a great job, did a great job with Tony. So it was a huge success, yeah. and he deserves it. So hopefully we will uh, come up uh, trailing behind him and, and do equally as well. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity. Man, but what a fun way to, because when you think of a traditional book, right, we, we know what that looks like. But this is... Now it's kind of like a graphic novel. It's a comic book, but still able to tell your full story in kind of a very fun, illustrated way. I've seen some of the pictures they're already posting and teasing online, and it just looks it looks fantastic. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I'm not an attractive man these days. But they've really sharpened their pencils, so I think maybe they're adding some 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 stuff to you. I wish they would put me some traps in there or something. <laughs> Oh, man, I can't wait. Guys, check it out again. The website is arncomic.com, uh, November 15th. That's when it gets going. You're going to hear us talk about it every single week on the show. We're, I'm extremely excited for Arn. And if you're a fan of the Four Horsemen, if you're a fan of the Enforcer, and I know you are because you listen to this podcast, this is going to be one of those things you have to have for your collection. You're going to need it. You're going to want to check it out. And I'm sure there's going to be different options of packages that you can get that include some special things, much like what they did with the tony release so keep an eye out for it check it out and arn i'm very excited for you to have this opportunity so more to come there as we continue we have a few two other things and then guys we're going to jump on the show i promise but these are important because these are your opportunities where you get to connect with the enforcer and and arn as he said earlier really does like to see all of you and talk with you you and brock are going to be appearing at wrestlecade thanksgiving weekend saturday november 26th at the benton convention uh, center that's in winston-salem the heart of horseman country baby and uh this is the big 10-year anniversary for this event arn and i've been to multiple events uh there that you and i i think we kind of actually might have first met at one of those events when you did your live show and uh tracy does a great job down there tracy myers uh, but you and brock are scheduled for a 10 o'clock to three o'clock appearance there on the 26th with photos meet and greets and Arn and Brock always take their time with you as a fan. So check it out. Uh, I know you're excited to be there for that one. Well, I'm proud to say last year I never even took a pee, a pee break. Cause Breaking out the diapers or adult diapers? Or what would you do, wear black pants? I just uh, <laughs> didn't think about it. You held it. But the line was that steady for five hours. And, That's and awesome, I'm, man. Nobody got left out. We made sure we stayed until, you know, it was a little bit past the time we were supposed to be there. But I didn't want anybody to have stood in line and not get the full treatment because it's our honor and our pleasure. And, you know, Brock's a he's a very respectful young man. And I think, you know, you get the sense of, of what a really a good kid he is when you talk to him. And uh, I've seen a lot of people walk away and go, you know, kind of give me a wink like... Yeah, you did good with this. Oh, one. no doubt about it. He is so respectful and such a, a great kid, and uh, you you should be nothing but proud of him. Arne. And he's getting better all the time. He ha- actually has aptitude for this, so I'm very proud of him. You know, I appreciate good. everybody supporting him. Thank you. 
And uh, and that next day, buddy, it's time for Brock, Jay Lethal, and that mystery partner. Well, they're going to be wrestling FTR and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat in the main event. It's at the Big Time Wrestling Show. That takes place at the Dorton Arena. The undercar, we've talked about it before. The Briscoes wrestling the Rock and Roll Express. That's going to be such a memorable day, memorable event. Uh, so tickets for both the show and meet and greets are available. So go support our man, Arn Anderson, the enforcer, his son, Brock. And all of the others, Thanksgiving weekend. Arn, I know you're looking forward to that big-time wrestling show. Well, I just wish I knew who the partner was. Really? No idea. Yeah. No, no, that's not kayfabe. That's, that's... Part of the mystery, I guess, okay. is they don't, they don't want it to get out. So they, I don't have to know. It doesn't matter to me. I, I can tell you right now, it doesn't really matter who it is. We're going in outmanned, outgunned, out everything. Mm. We may just, but you know, <laughs> we may just have to choose sides up again or something. I don't know, buddy. Dax, Cash, and Steamboat. I mean, that's how they're looking across the ring at. I, I don't know that it gets much better. I mean, Dax and Cash probably the best tag team in wrestling right now. Of course they are. You know, and and it's it's Ricky's day. Let's face it. It's, yeah. it's about Steamboat. You know, I don't, he hasn't been in the ring in a long, long time, but I guarantee you he's in tip top shape and he will be spot on with everything can't wait great events you can see them there live so check it out and uh Arn, as i uh as we start to get into the show there was some feedback that came in on our youtube channel uh, from our friends at central states wrestling they responded to some of your comments uh when you got to work and had that opportunity to work be a part of their prom uh, promotion and uh, i wanted to share some of that with you because we encourage Please our do. fans to look up the show and other shows central states has put on a lot of good shows and we want to support those guys uh as they have been supporting us and you double a uh but i wanted to mention that we've had several of our fans and listeners put over the horseman store merchandise avid listeners uh, Riddler 357, his username on YouTube said this. A few days ago, I received my Arn 4 Horseman shirt, and I was impressed. The shirt was true to fit, very comfy, and made a quality material. Ordering that shirt was simple and fast. It took about four days to arrive. Box of Gimmicks has plenty of selections. Paul hit the nail on the head. This is the wrestling we grew up on. Looking forward to the comic book in February 2023. Man, that's exactly it. Box of gimmicks. We got a couple extra uh, things out there now that just came hot off the press as we record today. Yep. Just be sure that you go to the Four Horsemen store. There's two. Yeah. We have two. Yep. You know, and uh, the you know all the t-shirts. They do a great job with them, and uh, you know people love nostalgia. We got the hats. The man, the white hats, Four Horsemen hats have just came out. Those are very sweet. And the the biggie, I feel like, are the horseman jackets, and they're, it's a any day now, them getting finished up for approval, and, and the second that we do and everything is, they're the proper size, the 2X is the 2X, and the 3X is the 3X. That's we right. make sure that there are no issues there. You'll be available to order them, and hopefully we can get them to you quickly. You know, maybe maybe for Christmas. That would be that'd be awesome. Uh, yeah, we're on group text right now, all about the jacket. But I do want to say, if you do go to the Arn store, the Arn Show store, that's where you're going to find that brand new Horseman Country Classic T-shirt, and it's in the style of the Mid Atlantic logo, and it says, "This is Horseman Country." It's got the the states uh, of the North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia outlined there. And it says the orange show, buddy. That shirt is smoking. It's a fantastic design. Thanks to Ryan for putting it together. And this was actually our research guy's idea. Uh, so man, lots of good, lots of good stuff over at the store. So check it out. Everybody affiliated with us is top shelf professional. There you go. Well, buddy, we're ready to kick things off, and we're going to dive into August 1990, and we're going to continue with our new format by including questions from our fans as we walk through this month. I know that you uh, you enjoyed that, and they enjoyed it. We're getting more and more questions, and we want your questions uh, for future episodes. So be on the lookout on socials for our pros asking for questions on the topics we'll be covering and uh, our infamous research guy is going to include as many as possible in the notes for the shows because at the end of the day, as Arn says, 
This is all about you and uh, getting to pick the brain of Arn Anderson. So, Arn, I want to open our discussion this month by discussing the direction that WCW aimed at Sting following his title victory over the Nature Boy. Uh, we talked about it last month, the big win at the Great American Bash. And I know it might annoy some of our listeners that I keep coming back to this, but I don't think that we can stress what a move this was for the company. As you've indicated for the past several weeks, WCW was a startup company. That's what you said at this point. And it looks like this title change has many more long-term implications than the ones of the past. And what I mean by that, for the better part of seven years, uh, you know, you had Ric Flair as the champion since Starcade 1983. Yes, he's dropped the belt to Dusty, to Kerry Von Erich, Ronnie Garvin, Rick Steamboat. But every one of those title reigns, Arn, uh, ended up just being part of storytelling, if you, if you will. But the decision it feels like here to move Sting into this number one spot didn't feel like it was just a storytelling device, but it felt like the company was wanting to make a shift to make Sting the face of WCW. Would I be, would I be right in, in saying that? Well, 100%. And, you know, even though Jim Hurd was still in charge, correct? Mm -hmm. And so you really didn't have a wrestling booker that could have laid out some really good stuff for Sting. Because it's a young man's business. It's always been a young man's business. And you have to have new and fresh, and you always have to have these young guys and girls coming along, you know, that are down underneath matches, first match, second match, third match, winning and winning. And you don't really even notice it because you're pushing that guy that's on top. This was time, the time for Sting to take his place where he would remain to this very day in the business. A top, top guy. And, uh, you know, it, it was a big switch, and uh, it was a very important fact that he beat Ric Flair because yeah. Ric was the most successful world champion of all time. That's about all you can really say about that. So he beat the best when he was still at his best. He did, and it was, it's a memory that many fans still remember to this day. We showed the clip uh, last week. But let's get into the story of August. Let's talk about what actually happened. And uh, as he came out of that, following the return uh, from the injury in July, Flair's return, uh, you know, as far as battling Sting, they placed off each other for the world title around the horn. Most of the matches would end with Sting winning by ping, uh, pinfall. And uh, following the finish, though, you and Barry would always jump in, beat down Sting. Uh, but it helped keep the heat on Nature Boy for the duration of the program, obviously. But, Arn, I want to get your opinion. Do you think that the clean pins by Sting was just to really help further validate him as the champion at this point? Absolutely. Yeah. Because it looked like it was not a fluke. If he beat him one time and he couldn't beat him ever again, what uh, what do you have there? You, you know, I would, if I'm a fan, I'm scratching my head going, well, God, but he, he won, and he won right in the middle, and that's the way it should have been. Baby faces win. Baby faces, you know, they sell merchandise. Heels sell tickets. Baby faces sell merchandise, they, you know, because people love them. They're their heroes. And, uh, you know, he had that incredible look. I still think that's one of the best looks of anybody in the history of the business, that, you know, that stinger, that the uh, the tights, the blonde hair, the whole deal. Body was in good shape. Everything. had the. It was the whole package. And, and the reason I make a point of that, uh, uh, talking through this, is because Flair didn't take many pinfalls, okay? He didn't take a lot of clean losses back in these days. But, man, oh. in these house shows, every single time, uh, Sting is pinning Flair's shoulders to the mat for the one, two, three. So you can tell the transition is there, the validation of Sting as, hey, he is going to be our flag bearer, and that's the plan for him. And for some time. Yeah, absolutely. These uh, The matches that he was having with Flair, they all went past the 20 and even 25-minute mark uh, with Flair doing his best. And, and you got to give it to Flair here, making Sting look like the man. Um, even so, there are indications in the research that several nights Sting was booed and Flair was cheered. Do you remember this occurring at all, Arne? Uh, at all, Arne? Yeah, well, that happened with us, you know, all the time. Once the Horseman thing was firmly entrenched, in the wrestling industry 
and they saw how hard we worked to make Sting and Luger and the Steiners and Dusty and the Rock and Roll Express and whoever it might be looked like just superstars because they were superstars and we wanted to make them look as good as we possibly could. That's what people started to appreciate and that's more what they were cheering, you know, that Rick was going, still going out and taking a world-class ass whooping on the way to getting beat. And that's what professionals do in this business. That's what heels do. You're, you're going to lose a lot. It happens. Well, Lauren, after working night in and night out with the nature boy Ric Flair and being pushed to his limit, the franchise was probably in search of a hot shower, nutritious food, and a good night's sleep. Unfortunately, working on the road, the Stinger was subjected to whatever sheets the Hilton provided to its guests. But today, Sting, Double A, and all the listeners of this show can up the sleep game with the help of our newest partner, Arn. Miracle Brand. We have a brand new sponsor. Isn't this exciting? I know yes. you can't wait to hear about this. We've talked about it before. Temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sweet sleep quality. So if you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Brand's bed sheets. Yeah, we're here talking bed sheets this week. They're inspired by silver infused fabrics made by NASA. It doesn't get much more technical than that. Miracle Brand makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Self cooling properties. Okay, this thing is for real. These sheets, are you kidding me? They make for better sleep. They use silver infused fabrics originally developed by NASA and uh, they are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long so you get a better sleep every night. They're self-cleaning, Arn. These sheets are infused with natural silver that prevents 99.9% .9 of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times, three times, three times longer than any other sheets, so there's no more gross odors. That's right, all you gross odor lovers. And then their luxurious comfort and quality, they're very comfortable. And without the high price tag, they make the perfect holiday gift. That's where we're at for your friends, your family, for you. Who doesn't want better sleep? And since these come with three free towels, you get two gifts in one just in time for the holidays. So my goodness, we got to tell you how to get them. Check it out. Here we go. Trymiracle.com forward slash Arn to try it today or gift it to someone special this holiday season. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40. That's 4-0%. And be sure to use our promo code ARN at checkout to save even more and get three free towels. Miracle is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're not 100% in, you'll get a full refund upgrade your sleep now arm what do you think of this deal with miracle brand this is awesome once you get past about 35 i would say a good night's sleep is one of the most important things in your life absolutely you have run hard and been hung up wet for some time now and you start to be a, an adult male and start to figure out man i'm tired Nothing like a comfortable, cool, refreshing set of sheets. Refreshing, cool, clean. Okay, clean. I talked about that. Clean sheets. Guys, this is a home run. I'm telling you, check it out. Again, go to that website. It's trymiracle.com forward slash Arn, and you will get the hookup. And let us know what you think. And we want to thank Miracle Brand for joining the Arn Show and sponsoring this episode. Arn, I, I did want to mention to you and uh, about you and Barry Windham. I talked about it. Coming to the aid of Nature Boy night after night, following the main events every night at the house shows. You and Barry worked the first half of the month together. So you guys will be wrestling JYD and Paul Orndorff in the semi-main events of the evening on every card that featured Sting and Flair. You've said previously on multiple occasions that working with Barry was like taking a night off. But I want to ask, because we'll see it as we continue our coverage this month and next, this is the first incarnation of the Horsemen without a tag team or tag team championships. Remember, it was you and Ole and, of course, you and Tully always carrying the wrestling tag titles. Do you remember if there was any discussion on making you and Barry or even you and Sid a regular tag team? Or, you mm. know, what was, what was going on there? 
Well, we were just kind of, you know, left to our own devices. Okay. I don't, I don't think the tag titles would have made us any more over than what we were. It was just one of those things that you've got to book the right matches with the right guys. You can't have Sid in a match when you've got, you know, your your top baby faces on the other side because somebody's got to give. Something's got to be a somebody's got to be a monster. Everybody can't be a monster. So, you know, it, the selection on some of the matches, uh, I still I'll say it again. I think we did a piss poor job of making Sid the monster he could have been. I mean, nobody has ever looked better and more menacing and just just scary. And uh, putting that tux on him for however many weeks it was, Lush. yeah, major, major mistake. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just think that uh, Barry was, was so easy. He fit into any scenario you wanted to put him in, and his professionalism and uh, his talent was unparalleled. Well, Arn, as we talk about uh, you and Barry working as a tag team, here we go. Our first two uh, questions from listeners this week. And uh, here we go. Carl Hayes wants to know, Arn, at this point, over the past few years, you had teamed with Ole, Tully, and Barry. How were the road trips and making the towns different which, with each of these partners? So uh, what was it like uh, traveling and the differences with Ole, Tully, and Barry? So we're talking on the road here. Yeah, yeah, sir. Yep. Well, I didn't, I didn't travel with Oli much. Okay. Very, very little. He he liked to do his own thing. Um, I didn't travel with Barry very much, because Barry liked to do his own thing. Barry was a cocktail guy. He wanted to go to whatever bar was, you know. If we were going on to the next town, Barry might stay in that town because he liked the cowboy joint, for example. Uh, especially when we're in the Carolinas or wherever, or Atlanta, or wherever our base was, and he had his own personal vehicle at his disposal to make these towns. Barry was riding around in uh, about a hundred and at the back then about a hundred thousand dollar vehicle, Porsche convertible, nice. white. Dark blue, I think, was his interior, but white. Had that long blonde hair flowing. Pretty good presentation pulling up to the cowboy joint, you know <laughs> what I'm right. saying? Yeah. And uh, the women loved him, you know. It didn't matter if he was a heel or whatever. He was yeah. a big, good-looking guy. And That's right. Carried himself with a well. Porsche. Yeah. With, with a Porsche. Right. And who was our other? Tully. Tully. Tully and I did travel together, and uh, I was still in that learning stage, in the, especially in the very beginning. I was at that learning stage, and I was soaking up every bit of knowledge that he would give me. And the best, still, the best way to, to get better in this business is after the show, travel together with your partner. Talk about the match, even if it's just going back to the hotel, you know, because the business has changed so much now. But... Anytime you can, when it's fresh in your mind and you're coming off of a match and you got your partner right there, you talk about the match and what do we do wrong? What could we have put right here? What could we put right there? You know, this was good. That, that worked. And, and that's how you learn in this business. You know, you just learn from people that are much more experienced and better than you are. And that was the case with Tully and I. He had a lot more experience at that point in time and was much more uh, mature in his thinking. There you go. Uh, Drew Landry chimes in. He said, wants to know how different uh, was Barry than your other tag partners like Bobby, Oli, Tully, and Haku. Did his size make him a unique partner? Oh, he was a great partner because Barry was one of these guys. I mean, he could superplex. I saw it several times, Animal. And the fact that Animal was willing to take a superplex off the top rope was unheard of. Yeah. I mean, they were the guys doing the bumping around. But when he when he got comfortable and he saw what a difference it made in the people's mind. Now, think about this. You're wondering, okay, I know who Arn Anderson is. I know who Barry is. But still, these are the road warriors. And suddenly you see Animal getting superplexed off the top. You start scratching your head and going, hey, maybe this ain't going to go the way I thought it was going to go. Right. That's what a difference it made. And... uh 
you know, he'd go out over the top like a, like a gazelle and land out there on the floor and ran in, run into the rail all in one motion. I mean, he just, he was just good. Yeah. You can tell as you talk about him, just how much admiration that you had for Barry and his skill set. And, you know, it's just one of those things as he went through his wrestling career and navigated, you just kind of always wondered, man, that guy had it all. His journey just took him a, a different direction. But if things could have worked out differently for him, he could have been a long time world champion. Yeah, and, you know, nobody's going to feel sorry for Barry. For God's sakes, he married a girl that the, her family owned half of Georgia. Oh, wow. There you go. Did you know that? I did not know that. I did not know that. Literally, they owned land, and it was Georgia Power was leasing land from them and like, the middle of Georgia to South Georgia. I mean, they owned, like, a hundred and something thousand acres. <sighs> Oh, yeah, man. So <laughs> he hit the jackpot. That Porsche yeah. was working for him. He landed and, someone. Uh, uh, yeah, the family loved yeah. the loved him. Loved Barry Wendham. I mean, wow. what, what was not to love about him? I mean, he was yeah, big lovable guy. Class act, handsome, successful, everything. Good, great yeah. personality. The whole, you know, like I said, the whole thing. And, Total package. Uh, and buddy. That was his first wife, and, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't have to feel sorry for Barry. That's <laughs> there you go. Put it to you that way. Enough said there. That's good. Well, listen, by the way, you were maybe not tag team champions, but you were the television champion, and we are here at our first clip of this week. We have the conclusion of a match, and this is uh, this is one over seven minutes. We're not playing, obviously, the whole seven minutes. But this is from August 11th, 1990, on an episode of NWA Pro, where you successfully defended your title against Lou Perez. That's right. I didn't say Al Perez. This is Lou Perez. Arn, this is our first clip of the week. Let's take a look at it. Let's see if it jogs my memory. Anderson, Wyndham, obviously the incomparable nature boy, Ric Flair, in the estimation of many, and this uh, broadcaster as well, the greatest world champion of yes, all time. Sir. All those men I mentioned have, are, will be, and are great challengers for Sting's world title. But yeah, the you, other one. But the big guy. <laughs> yeah, you go. 6'9", 338. Yes, I think that's the man that they're grooming perhaps for the world's heavyweight championship. That is, in case Flair doesn't beat Sting in the meantime, which could very, very definitely happen. There's no doubt. You got to, right now, they got to be ranked as the most awesome group in all of sports, Jim. If you look at the top ten contenders, the horsemen probably would occupy perhaps the top four spots in many polls. And right there, Lou Perez trying to get a sunset clip on Arn Anderson, but he met that big left hand again, and the left hand has been a very prime weapon of Arn Anderson in this television championship event. And Arn Anderson showing you that he had the power to withhold that sunset flip, and that took a lot of power and strength on his part. Boy, he looks a lot like Al, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. I, I got some info on him, too. I'll share with you after we watch this. Bob, we've got a great tag team matchup, a dream tag team match in the eyes of many. Flying Brian and the Z-Man and the Midnight Express. What a match that's going to be, Jim. I'm really looking forward to that one, and I know all you fans that want to see it, don't miss it. Next week, Right here, 6.05 on TBS. Anderson, after tossing Perez out on the floor, follows him out. Got him right up against that pole. And Anderson hit the pole with that clothesline. Now, this may be the break, no pun intended, that Perez was looking for. Let's see if he can take advantage. I had just started to say that this is where Arn Anderson could probably do some of his most dangerous work. Perez sends him to the near side, catches him with a drop kick. Nice move. On He's, top. Got him covered. He's got him covered. Lateral press. A near fall there. The television champion in trouble as Lou Perez sends him for the ride one more time. Elevates him on top again with a lateral press. And again, Anderson kicks out. Perez senses it right now, though, Jim. Look how quick he is back to the attack. The adrenaline is really flowing on the young challenger from the sunshine state of Florida. Perez with those right hands. And again, Anderson. Try to timing drop. Perez blocks it, but he got him right there. Waist lock into the spine buster. And Arn Anderson has just finished it off. Indeed, he has. The horsemen are dominant. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the match and still world television champion enforcer, Arn Anderson. So there you go, Arn. Uh, did it ring any bells for you as you watched that one? 
God, he looked identical to I saw his face up close. He looked identical to Al. So he is, he was billed as the younger brother of Al Perez, but in all actuality, he is his cousin. Pretty damn close. I know, but they look, you're right. They look just like they could be brothers. So there Handsome you go. Handsome guys, tan, good bodies. Good, good hair. Good, good worker. You had to go there, didn't you? <laughs> had to go to the hair. I left the <laughs> hair out. Thought, yes, great hair. They had, Well, and I say that because they had the exact same hairstyle. Haircut, hairstyle. And that's why it's confusing. They looked exactly alike. I was fixing to say, no, no, that's out. It can't be that close to I saw his face. And there was just a, just a slight difference, but very close. Yep. Well, hey, listen, one of the other things that happened regularly, Arn, during this month was the horsemen taking on the dudes with attitudes and six-man tag matches. Usually it was JYD, Orndorff, and Elegante, our favorite, uh, taking on you, Sid, and Barry. Oh, your face is great. So here we go, our second clip of the week. We're going rapid fire. You take the lead on a stand-up interview promoting this match that's going to take place at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. This is, uh, again, August 18th, 1990 from NWA Pro, second clip of the week. Here we go. Gante, Junkyard Dog, Paul Orndorff against Sid Vicious, Arn Anderson, and Barry Windham. One guy on this earth, we got the same philosophy as it's called Lawrence Taylor. You people of the Meadowlands know him better than anybody else. What he claims is on his worst day, he's better than anybody else. The horseman in any combination, better than anybody else. Rest assured, we got a giant too. He's called Sid Vicious. Tell him, big man. Elegante, you're not going to be such a big man when you're face down. World title return match. Sting and the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Friday night, Ric Flair, woo, walks that out. And everybody nationwide knows the title comes back. Think about it, Sting, your first trip to the Meadowlands. It's a big, big building. The fans are wild. And they like great wrestling. That's me, personified. So Friday night, seven times? Maybe, maybe not. I'm a betting man, I got lots of money, and I'm betting on myself to become the world champion the seventh time Friday night, being the Meadowlands. Woo! And it's all coming your way. Here's a look at this gigantic card. 95.5 PLJ, welcome to NWA to the Meadowlands. Once again, Friday, August 24th, 8 o'clock. Big Ben Vader will be on this gigantic card. Also, you'll see Stan the Larry Hanson against Wildfire Tommy Rich. Man tag, El Gigante, the Junkyard Dog, this wonderful Paul Orndorff against Sid Vicious, Arn Anderson, and Barry Windham, the Horseman. Lex Luger defends the U.S. title against Mean Mark, world tag title. Ricky and Robert, the Rock and Roll Express, will take on Doom. But the big event is the NWA world title return match. The new world champion Sting in the Meadowlands defends against the former champion Nature Boy Ric Flair. Tickets to the box office and all area ticket master outlets. Yeah, I had to leave in that little bit at the end because I just love that classic wrestling music. It gets me every time. My childhood buddy comes back when I hear certain jingles like that yeah i dig it too yeah um, you know yeah, one of the one of the um beautiful things that happens when you're on tv all the time and you know you travel around the way we do and you kind of develop this notoriety and you know a lot of football players baseball players different different guys of of all walks of life, you know, love wrestling. And uh, Lawrence Taylor was one of those guys. At that time, he had a sports bar that was in the same almost parking lot from the stadium. He invited us over, and uh, and I'm sitting there, man. I'm I'm slugging down some Miller Lights or some Sea Breezes or something, and I'm just looking there, and I'm I'm looking at, at LT, and I'm going, this is the damnedest. How did I get here? Yeah, what is my life, essentially, is what you're thinking. He's the greatest football player that ever lived. If you just look and just pure impact on a game, and I know quarterbacks and they get all that. Brother, he would disrupt a game to the point to where it where he just took it over. He's just an animal and a beast and just, what a, what a, he's just sitting there like a regular guy, you know. We're up in his office and... You know, they bring up a bunch of drinks and stuff, and we're just shooting the shit. And, and I just just found myself, you know, just going, man, how did I get here? What a perk. Now, so now that you say that, it triggers me to want to ask, can you remember any other time? That's a big moment. 
Can you remember a couple other times in your life where you kind of had that same, like, what, what is my life? How did I get here? What, I can't the, believe I'm meeting this person. Well, the, it's a little different, uh, okay. but, but the same. Muhammad Ali. Okay. He came to a show, and him and Tommy Hearns in uh, Detroit, I believe it was, and uh, everybody was lined up like the office people with Turner. And, I mean, this this is Muhammad Ali. You know, he's in the back, and and he's signing stuff for, for all the higher-ups with, with Turner. And and I'm, I'm maybe 10 or 12th back of the line, and, he, you know, we're all just – being respectful, sitting there with her mouth shut. And he looked up, and he just kind of, I looked around, me? Come on up, champ. He came up, and uh, I walked. Man, it was heat. They, all these people with Turner, these are like the suits, you know? But what are you going to do? He said, come on up. I came up, and he said, sit down. Big match tonight champ and I'm you know I, I had a boxing glove for him to sign still got it upstairs one of my prized possessions I said yeah they're all big champ <laughs> for me he says I'm sure you'll do fine mm. boom and I just floated off floated <sighs> off down the hall I mean there was something about the aura around that man that just he was something other than just a mere mortal there was something special about him. He just had this, this aura. It's the only way I could express, you know, explain it. Yeah. Uh, that's the two him and LT that really stand out. Now here's the thing, because it's uh, you know, as as you talk with people, one of the biggest regrets is, man, I never got the picture. Did you get? Were you able to get pictures with those guys? Or oh yeah. Oh good. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. One more. We're in uh, wrestling for WWF. Okay. Tully and I were in San Diego, sports arena. So he knocks on the locker room door. One of the guys that worked there opened the door and goes, hey, uh, you know, there's a there's a guy out here with his grandson. Said they just came down here to see you guys. You know, would you and Tully mind coming out signing something for us? And we're heels. And normally I'd just go, ah, Tell them, you know, after the show or something, just, you know. Yeah. But I, but I said, well, what the hell? You know, it's a different mindset. So we walk out the door. Guy standing there yucking it up with his grand grandson. There was a couple of kids. Who do you think it was? Grandson. And this is where? L.A.? L.A. Or San uh, Diego. San Diego. San Diego. I, I don't know. And Gene, ha Gene Hackman. <laughs> Yeah, I never would have guessed that, but oh, Mr. Hoosiers. Great actor. Yeah, so great, many movies. Great Lex actor. Luthor, the original from Superman, so many movies. Oh, God, The Firm. The Firm, yeah, I mean, we could yeah, sit here I'm all day. Great. And there was one other guy, just, so because, cool. just because of his physique. It was an old Western called Laredo. Have you ever seen that? Probably not. And it was William Smith who played Falconetti in Rich Man, Poor Man. Did you see any of that? No. Now, that's something that you would probably enjoy watching. It was okay. a series on TV. Look it up. But Falconetti, brother, I, when I was a kid, impressionable, you know, bodies are the, are the thing that got my attention. You know, how do I look like that? He was like the first guy I saw with the physique set of arms like that he wore this buckskin like shirt short sleeve that was real tight his frigging guns were and one day we're working uh la and in the back they always had the celebrities would come back and meet the wrestlers and all that stuff and there were fans and i'm walking down the hall and i looked over and sitting on a crate there he was Older in life, yeah, but still ruggedly good. Every which way you can. You remember that movie no. with Clint Eastwood? I no, I didn't. Well, see you it. have a, you missed a lot of cinema, haven't you? <laughs> I'm more of the '80s '80s movies and forward. Yeah, he played the heel opposite uh, Clint Eastwood, and okay. the, the, the whole theme of that is 
bare knuckle fighting. So I just I looked over and it was, you know, he smiled and I just stopped. Nobody signed anything or took any pictures. I just, I just stopped. He's sitting up on a crate like you know one of the boys and I just said, man, you were the first guy that ever inspired me to go to a weight room. Wow. And uh, we had a nice conversation. Yeah, yeah, man, I'm a wrestling fan. You guys work your ass off. Da, Isn't da, that da. something, these guys that end up being wrestling fans and like fans of yours, and, and yet you were such a big fan of theirs as a kid? Yeah. How cool is that? Well, here's your reality, and I think I'm not speaking out of turn. All athletes, I don't care who they are, they all like and respect other athletes that can do something that they can't. And that's where the respect level comes in because they do their thing at, a, at the highest level possible and they look at another guy in another league or, or another sport or something else and, and go, God almighty, that guy's a hell of an athlete. Arn, one of those things I got to tell you, though, before because obviously we're off the rails a little bit and we'll get back into August, but one of the things that I want to tell you, as you go do your meet and greets and things like that, I think it's important to know that for many of the fans that are going to see you, many of the fans that are listening to this show that will meet you at some point in time, you are their Falconetti. You are their Lawrence Taylor. Wow. You are that. And I, and I mean, I know that's hard for you are their Muhammad Ali because that's you. They grew up watching you. You were their hero. And, and, you know, so I know it's hard for you to understand sometimes when you're in it, right. And you're just doing your thing. It's hard for you to put yourself in that mindset of that position to kind of see that. But uh, I think it's when now talking about how you felt meeting those who that's how people feel meeting you, dude. Well, that's that's very kind of you. Well, it's, it's the reality of it, man. I'm telling you, these people. And I just want you to think about that as you go out there, because, you know, it's uh, what you do and your kindness and the kindness that you've shown to people that listen to the show right in and that you've met. Man, it makes lasting impressions for a lifetime. I see it in my own son's life when he meets some of his favorite wrestlers now. So it's it's huge. You know the quote that, that sticks with me every single time, no matter where I am, that I'll never forget is when people look at you and, and they go, you were a big part of my childhood. Mm, yep. It's not what you do for people. It's how you make them feel. And that's another one of my quotes. And when you brought so much joy to uh to people and and then when they think of nostalgia and what they grew up on and what they love buddy you and some of your buddies in this business were at the center of it uh, well you know we're very fortunate to be one of the small percentage of people that every day of our life we got to go to work and do something we truly loved not many people can say that so yeah. we have been blessed and if you don't realize that and you're in this business, you need to get out because it's a gift, it's an honor, it's a privilege. Nobody, this business doesn't know anybody anything. We owe it everything. Yeah. Well, there you go, Arn. And uh, man, thank you for everything. This is this has been been awesome. So we'll continue to talk here about what was going on in August. I feel like that was uh, something that our listeners are definitely going to enjoy just hearing you talk about some of those experiences in your own personal life. But uh, you guys would continue on the Horsemen, uh, making your trek through, working with uh, Orndorff. We just talked about that big build up match as we watched that clip to the Meadowlands. The finish came again with that match when Orndorff hit you with the pile driver. Barry jumped off the top rope, hitting Orndorff and then putting you on top for the win. But we can almost say about 100% sure that I'm sure Orndorff uh, put in the bulk of the work for his team, considering who his partners were. But for a moment, I want to sit under the learning tree of you one more time. Can you explain to our fans how important it was for Sid and even Elegante to be featured in a six-man tag match and why, concerning their level of experience, a six-man tag was probably the best means of, uh, of presenting them at this point in their careers? Well, the idea was right to protect them. Yeah. The problem is there's only a couple of us in there that can actually go to the links to protect them that we needed to to do, you know? it's a, Let's face it, George the 8-foot stiff, zero. You, you weren't going to get anything out of him. <laughs> George, the eight-foot stiff. I love it. Yeah, and I'm sure Orndorff bounced around for Sid. 
JYD was getting in later years of his yes. life. I'm sure his health was not good, but I did everything I could do for him because he got my first break. He helped with my first break when I worked for Bill Watts, and that story is pretty well known. He suggested to send me with Matt Bourne to Atlanta as his partner, who was a top guy working for Bill Watts at the time, and um, put Paul Ellering with us as a team. So JYD is the one suggested that to Bill Watts, and that was my first break. So I was ever grateful for you know for what he had done for me. I still feel very indebted to him because uh, you know things happen for a reason. Had you not got that break, though, who knows? Yeah, you know because it started the snowball rolling down the hill for me. So I did everything I could for JYD, but at some point, you know, in there, it just. You ran out of tackling dummies and and too many people that needed them. So it just was not a great booking. It wasn't. And it's funny because Michael McClanahan, he's a big time supporter on ad free shows, had a follow up question along those lines. And he wants to know about in ring psychology with a six man match versus a traditional, you know, four person, you know, two on two tag match. Does it change? Does in ring psychology change when it gets to when it grows, if you will, to three on three at all? Uh, no, you know, in some ways it's, if you've got three guys on the other side, three baby faces that can perform, here's a simple formula. You get one of them in at a time and the three bad guys feed them. Tag the next one guy in, he comes in, the three bad guys feed them. Third guy comes in, you make stars out of all of them and right at the peak of that third guy really shining, you cut his legs out from under him, and that's who sells. And then it's a piece of cake. You make legal tags. You utilize the referee getting out of position. Then you do all your dirty work. But it's real easy because when you got one guy knocking three guys around, that can be pretty exciting. And the audience, as long as their, their reaction kept climbing, we kept feeding them. And just when you, you, know, you feel like they had enough, then you got your heat. Yeah. And that's the psychology behind a six man. I, I want to talk a little bit about Sid Arn here. And we, we had already touched on it earlier on in the show about, you know, the, his presentation, the talks and, and everything that was kind of went wrong there. But, uh, man, he had so much untapped potential. And Sid, by the way, not Flair, would challenge Sting for the world title at the next pay-per-view. But here we are. We're in August would it be fair to say that ho the horsemen were tasked with really trying to get Sid over at this point, or was the mandate from the office to make the most of his look and raw potential? Like, what what was going on with Sid here? Because it was obvious they wanted to fast track him. Again, he's going to be the big man for the next pay per view. Uh, but what's going on here with, with them? What is your kind of what what are they what are they tasked you with with Sid? Well, it was a it, and again, I don't even remember who was actually doing the day-to-day -day instruction slash booking. What are we doing here? You know, I know that we did everything we could possibly do on TV day to not expose him. You know, it was the lesser of two evils. It was a catch-22. You wanted to get him out there. You wanted the people to see that body. You know, he, he did a really good clothesline. He did a really good big high boot, you know. He, there was a few things that he did. You wanted to get him in, get those things done, and get him out so you didn't expose him. He was green, you know, which we all were green at some point. I think we all stay green to a degree our whole career. You you can never continue, you know, to not learn. And as long as you're learning, that means that you're still a little bit green. Um but, you know, you try to get him in, try to get him featured in the match, but you don't want a guy that, you know, that might try to take a liberty with him with Sid not knowing better, you know, and maybe take too much of the match. It was a, it was a chess game. Speaking of uh, a green, nice transition here. Sid Vicious, obviously, big presence about him. He had a strict gym regimen and diet, I'm sure. 
But for those of us a little less disciplined than the man hailing from anywhere he damn well pleases, we often need some help finding that next gear thanks to schedules, lack of energy, and other issues. That's why I started using our Athletic Greens. Getting back to green. And thanks to our partner, Athletic Greens, you can find the extra energy and feed your body the vitamins and nutrients it needs to function at the Sid Vicious levels. That's what I'm talking about. Or in just one scoop, it gives you 75 high quality vitamins and minerals. I'm talking about improving gut health, sleeping better, which you and I love to do, sleep, improve focus. Man, this is a slam dunk, and I know you're a big supporter of Athletic Greens. Matter of fact, I'm out, so if they're listening right now, I need some sent to the house. Pronto. There you go. Brock takes it. I, I take it. It's one of those things that you don't realize what good it's doing for you until you take a day or two off. You know, you get between boxes that they're very kind and generous and send to the house and maybe you run out a couple of days and then you start to go well damn i don't feel as good as i should mm. what's different what's going on sleep okay last night yeah slept okay eat okay yeah eat okay well what was it gotta be the athletic greens Listen, it can help you too. Sleep quality, Arn touched on it. Recovery, he works out all the time, helps him there. Costs less than three bucks a day, completely worth the investment. And it's received 7,000 or more, 5,000, I mean, five stars, should I say, reviews. So right now is the time to reclaim your health, arm your immune system. We're getting into that time of the season. Everything's happening. Allergies, flu, it's cold, uh, weather's changing. And this can help one scoop in your water every single day. Make sure you get all the vitamins that you need and no pills. That's what we're talking about. So listen, how can you get it? Check it out. Athleticgreens.com forward slash ARN. That's the key word to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate. That's right. The ultimate daily nutritional insurance. One more time. Athleticgreens with an S.com forward slash ARN. So, Arn, in July, we saw you take precious TV time to put Sid over in a two-man stand-up. This week, Sid is featured in an enhancement match alongside you and the Nature Boy, giving him instant credibility. That's just what you guys did. We have the clip uh, in our third clip of the week. Here's what happened when the Horseman took the ring on August 18th on this episode of Worldwide. Here we go. But, no, I guess they're on work release. They're on work release. And they come. Big Sid Vicious showing the power. Whoa! I bet he would rather be out picking up garbage along Interstate 85 down around Macon somewhere than in this ring getting his brains kicked out by Sid Vicious. Sid Vicious, a powerful man. But when you say Sid Vicious could be the next U.S. champion to do that, he has to go through the man that many people feel is the greatest U.S. champion ever. And that is the total package Lex Luger. Lex Let's not also discount that Ric Flair, not only is he still on the heels of Sting, but he also is a man who was a U.S. champion at one time and also was a man at one time was considered one of the greatest U.S. champions ever. Yes, that's correct. And Ric Flair knows he would like to... He would like to take the very good move, Ric Flair, very good move. He would like to take the United States title off uh, Lex Luger because he knows to get back in the title hunt, he's going to have to have a belt around his waist. Elbow right to the chin, right to the chest of Brad Bass and Arn Anderson, the world television champion. Any combination of horsemen, we've said it so many times, very successful. Whether it be in a six-man or whether it be in tag team ma matches, they are very good. Now for the ride. Best What's going on now? The sp Maybe it's a power bomb. No, I think it's a. Uh, he's trying to act like a uh, a helicopter. And he's going to spin this boy about 2,000 revolutions per minute. Oh my goodness! Ooh. And now the Nature Boy Rick Flair, the Horseman, looking better than we've ever seen him. Well, and the question still is. This is the most 
think the referee was getting in the way of what they were trying to accomplish. And what is this? Orndorff. Good your dog at seven foot, seven inch. Oh, he got there. I love the interaction with you and uh, Big George. <laughs> did you see how far he chunked me? He did, man. I mean, he had that raw giant strength, but he just was not cut out for this business. Uh, there's just nothing past that. It was like the, a, a throw or a toss or a push, but you won't get nothing else out of him, man. No, uh. nothing. And, and, you know, the, you look at that and the reality is, Rick and Sid should have kept going. That it, when you stop and there's that that uncomfortable short yes. distance between each other, it's just not good. No, wasn't good. We have a couple of uh, Sid questions here from our listeners. Uh, Thomas Danucci wants to know if Sid seemed appreciative of being a member of the Horsemen, or was he more aloof, apathetic, or something else altogether? No, it was fine. Um, I think you know eventually. You know, by people telling him and him discovering, you know, he had a lot to offer as a single. And, uh, you know, but, the, you know, he was very receptive to being helped. He was very receptive. You know, I never had a crossword with Sid. It was always very positive. Mm. Scott Gold wants to know, as far as Sid, what is one thing that never uh, that he never got that would have leveled him up? Is there one thing that you feel like, man, if it would have clicked with this guy, he could have been? Um, maybe the ability to be patient. You know, I know that he went to WWF and, you know, a couple different places, and they started out to give him the mega push, and if it slowed down a little bit, maybe he got discouraged. I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't in the room to talk to him about it, but... Sometimes, you know, like they would test you, especially yeah. when you go to WWF. They would have you get beat by a guy that just had no business beating you in the world just to see how you handled it, mm. like in a dark match before yeah. TV or something. Just wanted to mess with you and see how you'd handle it. Well, yeah, see yeah. if you had a problem getting beat or what your issue was, yeah. if you had one at all. And it was just a test. Some guys, you know, would take it and be insulting, go, well, what, what the fuck? You know, I'm a Lamborghini. Why are they putting a dent in me? For no yeah. apparent reason, what the, what the hell? Yeah, and uh, you know, other than that, I don't know. You know, it was just a question of timing and being in the right place right at place, the right, right time. time. There you go. Uh, well, a major match that took place during this month featured you taking on Lex Luger, and it would be August nineteenth edition of the main event. And in our fourth clip of the week, we have a stand-up interview with you and Missy Hyatt and the conclusion of this match. Now, like I said, this is our fourth clip, so we're going to take a look. This is from August 19th. It's the main event, 1990. I'm here with Iron Anderson, and you know what? I would say good luck in your match coming up with Lex Luger, but you don't need it. You're a four horseman. Exactly right, Missy. I'd rather be lucky than good, but in this situation, this is what I do. I'm better than anybody else in one-on-one -on -one wrestling. I'm not a marketing man. I'm not a gym owner. I'm a wrestler. I excel from bell to bell. Look at your crying, your squalling, your sin. Something that might have happened to you. I think it's bad karma. On this given night on national television shortly, I want you as much as you want me. Too strong to be pinned with that particular maneuver. I think his legs have got to be neutralized. A lateral press just won't pin someone as strong as Lex Luger. And Anderson is a strong competitor. Nice headbutt there. Now he's on top. Uh oh. Anderson there now at a distinct disadvantage. Back into the ropes. Pulls himself up. And Luger. 
Porter fights back. The U.S. champion, who was allegedly attacked by the horseman in a parking lot. Good elbow by Anderson. One move ahead of Luger on that exchange, on that particular sequence. He was ahead one move. Lateral press, but again, Luger too strong, and he kicks out. That's why I say that when Luger teams with the dudes with attitudes, whether it be any combination of El Higante, JYD, Mr. Wonderful, whomever it may be, against Anderson, Vicious, and Wyndham, it's going to be a six-man match. It's a dream match. You just don't want to miss. Arn Anderson. With a few more seasons experience than Lex Luger. Controlling the tempo. Anderson is a real strategist. He has earned the reputation as the enforcer of the horseman, but he's also a highly intelligent competitor. Left shoulder buried to that itch midsection of Lex Luger. But Luger counters there. Luger countered with that move. And now the tide may turn here on TBS in the main event. Anderson for the ride. There's an elbow. And now the awesome United States heavyweight champion. Turning it up a notch. There's a power slam. He's setting Anderson up quite obviously for the human torture rack. Anderson upstairs. Anderson in trouble. Luger's got him where he wants him. There's Flair and Vicious. Sid Vicious and Rick Flair. Double teaming the total package that's Luger. Flair and Luger have had a tremendous rivalry. But here comes the jump card dog. Here comes the world champion Steve. There you go, uh, Arm. Big match there with you and uh, and Luger, and uh, it's safe to say much different Luger than you wrestled in the years past. He gained experience, and uh, so that's good for you. Though, what was it like wrestling someone who you kind of helped teach and develop and mentor, uh, Lex, into the performer that we just saw? Well, it was uh, refreshing to see that he had gotten better. I had a part of that. Uh, I feel like uh, you just have to be patient. And uh, he was a big, strong, good-looking guy. And, you know, he started to pick it up and getting to wrestle guys with a lot more experience was was critical, just like it is today. It's the only way you get better is to wrestle someone better than you. The one thing I noticed, that had to be one of those, like Gainesville, Georgia, or something, smaller venues, because, buddy, it, it was hot in there. Did you see the sweat? Yeah, glistening. Both, both of us had going, not yeah. just me. And... Uh, so the atmosphere was right. You know, the fans were rabid. Those hot hot buildings made them ornery. So they were very, very vocal. Um, and, you know, it was expected almost for if we got in trouble for the, you know, the horsemen hit the ring, it was almost expected. So we gave them what they thought they should get. So we see the horsemen run down. DQ ends the match, and because of this way, this of the way this one ended, let's ask Eric Bowman's question. He said, "Arn, you mentioned in a previous episode that you did not always like when matches ended with countout or even a DQ. I think you called it flat. What are your thoughts on chicken shit heels using the countout loss as a way of keeping the belt?" I've never liked countouts uh, because they're not usually done correctly. It's like. The heel just grabs his title or whatever and just walks down the aisle and there's a eight, nine, ten, and it's over. Now they can be exciting if there's a title on the line and both guys are on the floor and they're trading back and forth. Bang, 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 eight, bang, 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 nine, bang, 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 ten. 
still bang, 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 and then you get knocked on your ass and uh, the baby face rolls in the ring, but it's too late. You both got counted out. Those can be exciting. So this one ended in DQ, as we talked about, when Sid and Flair jumped in the ring. Clearly the top line creative here, the direction is horsemen versus dudes with attitudes. So I have this is a great question from Brian DeBrains. That's right, Brian DeBrain, and he says, uh, how come WCW didn't do war games this summer of 1990? You had the horsemen and you had the dudes with attitudes, and that feud seemed perfect for that match. And just so you're aware, Arn, there were no war games in 90, but the match would come back 91. Ole is the booker. We've talked about it um, already in this show. We were talking about some of the booking decisions. It's Ole. Dusty's not back yet. Uh, but when he does, WCW will hold war games in 1991. Do you think that's it, that it's just a booking decision and Ole's just, nah, I don't think so? Or could it be the injury to Sting and that it's not a good place for it? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I just I think that there was no leadership. You know, at the first part of the WCW come into fruition, it just, you didn't have a wrestling booker. You had either a committee or you had Jim Hurd coming down, you know, you had three or four guys on a committee and he would say, this is what I want to see. And you would try to make his wishes come true because you knew if he didn't, you know, the guy's a hard ass, he'd have probably canned you. So then once you got, you know, Go ahead. I was going to say, was Ole a guy, though, that would say, so say Jim Hurd gave certain direction. Would Ole be a guy that would challenge Hurd? I don't know. I wasn't behind. Okay. I got a feeling that if he went too far with it, Hurd would have canned him, which he probably eventually did anyway. You know, it ended up happening. So uh, on his watch, I'm almost positive that Hurd canned Ole. And then I think Hurd got canned, if I'm not mistaken. I may be mistaken, which allowed the door for Dusty to come in. I just have to think that Dusty would have fought for his War Games concept when he came back in to be Booker. I mean, sure, he wants to have that match. He's the creator of the War Games. Whereas maybe if Hurd was like, eh, cold on it or a little bit, uh, Ole might have been a guy that just, okay, then we're just not going to do War Games. Well, Dusty would have been smart enough to probably have a piece of paper in his pocket with the gross of every war games that went around the country back when it was drawing out the ass. He yeah. said, oh, so you don't want to do it. Well, let's see. We did this in uh, Jacksonville, this in Miami, this in Charlotte, this in Cincinnati. He probably ran down that list of paper, and the guy, what, how do you combat that? Well, okay, let's go with it. Dusty would have looked at him and said, I don't know what you call it, Daddy, but I call it selling a lot of pizza. Do you understand what I'm saying? Maybe you get it in that lingo, Daddy, you know? So. Tim Hood. <laughs> Fold out, baby. Fold out. You Fold understand? Out. That's right. Don Daddy. Anderson and the dream started. Everyone. <laughs> there you go. That's right. So listen, as we round out this month, you, Sid, and Flair would conduct a promo with the leader of Slap Dick Nation, your buddy, uh, Tony Schiavone, in our final clip of the week. Let's listen to what the three of you had to say as we close down August of 1990. ECW this week, where we talk to the top stars of the NWA. I want to bring in the four horsemen right now. The nature boy, Ric Flair, of course, Big Sid Vicious, and Arn Anderson. There's no question that Sting still has the world heavyweight title. Lex Luger is the U.S. heavyweight champion, but I know each and every time they go to the ring, they keep looking behind them because the horsemen are always there. First of all, I'd like to say you're looking very dapper today, Tony. You've well, got that Undertaker look. Let's still be trying to soften no blood out of the horsemen, do you understand? Okay. You, just like the management, just like the fans, just like Ted Turner, have been leaning towards Sting and protecting Lex Luger from our killer. Long enough. Sting, i got to congratulate you, my friend. i got to pat you on the butt. I never thought you'd be champion as long as you have, but see, here's the difference. I always wanted to be world champion. So did Sid. So did Barry Windham. But Ric Flair always was champion, so we put it aside. He's family. He's a horseman. But now, it's open season. Whichever one of us get a shot at you, don't think we're going to be trying any vengeance for Flair. It's going to be for us. You see, I want to make the big bucks. I want to be the world champion just like Sid, just like Rick, just like Barry. Think about that. When you talk about success stories, when you talk about big things happening in professional sports, 
Then you got to point to the four horsemen. We have done it all in combinations. And now we've got a new force behind us. A man that has my stamp of approval. He's 6'9". He weighs 330 pounds. And I can't wait till he takes that blonde prima donna Lex Luger and breaks him in two. As far as Sting is concerned, it's open season, Sting. You can run, but you can't hide. Look at it like this. There's four of us. There's two of you. There's tons of ability here. And all of us wanting those championship belts. Big Sid, you're a man of few words. But please... Shock these guys right now with a real line drive right at Luger. Luger, you remember one thing, boy? You're mine, and don't forget it. That's right, fans. We'll have more action right after this. Right after this, time out. So there you go. You called Tony the Undertaker uh, at the beginning. Did you catch that? Yeah, the handsome devil. Yeah, you look baby face. He looked about 12 years old. Whoever thought he'd be known as the leader of Slap Dick Nation back then? I mean, or is it a Slap Nuts? It's he he goes sla- he calls his listeners Slap Dicks. See, Slap Nuts is Jeff Jarrett. Slap Dicks is Tony. Oh telling me. yeah, yeah. That's, yeah that's sl- true. Everybody's slapping something arm in their pants. I don't know what these guys are doing. Uh, we're getting back to that blue chew gimmick. <laughs> But listen, finally, Flair got Sid's height and weight correct. So we're, we're progressing. We're moving forward. We're figuring things, things out. He's great big. That's how tall and big he is. Great big. Go. But, uh, but, but getting back to serious stuff here. So you started off by telling Sting it doesn't have to be Flair that beats him for the belt. Flair takes this his interview time and endorses Sid in the upcoming match against Luger for the U.S. title. Then Sid uh, tells Sid to hit the go-home line and shirtless Sid. That's right. No tuxedo this time. He delivers the strike. At this point, Arn, it's very clear that WCW does see money in Sid because we know he's going to challenge Sting, as I said, for the world title at Halloween Havoc in Chicago in less than 60 days. In your opinion, was this too soon for Sid, or do you believe he was ready for those matches against both Luger and Sting? Well, you, sometimes you got it's trial by fire. You got to get out there and just go for it. And, you know, you could say holding it off is is better. Who knows how I say put them in the mix. Okay. You know, and, and Sting and Luger would have been, they know what was done for them. Now it's time to give it back. And you got to make what you were looking at, which is said, that monster, you got to make it real. Arn says, get him battle tested, which I like. You know, if you if you got someone on your hands that you think is going to be a, a star, a stud, uh, let's let's start putting them through the ropes and then let's see what they got. So How will you go. know till you try? There you go. Well, listen, Arn. Next week we're going to continue our walk through your career. Uh, we're looking at the Clash of the Champions. You're teaming with Flair, the creation of the Black Scorpion. Uh, that's going to be something you're going to be getting, beginning a new program with doom and the build to Halloween havoc. Uh, I can't wait for that. But before we get off the air, I want to remind everybody, check out arnshow.com. That's your one-stop shop for all things Arn show. Whether you want to listen to an episode there, whether you want to find where box of gimmicks or find out that merchandise link, arnshow.com is also going to have all our social media handles as well. So check out that website, arnshow.com, and then arncomic.com. Come November 15th, that's the place to be to find this awesome new comic on Arn's life and history. Arn, I uh, had a lot of fun with you this week, my friend. Me too, buddy. Kickstarter, www.arncomic.com. There How'd it is. I do? How'd I do with that? You did good. I like it. I'm going to have you start reading the ads. I'm, I'm gonna, No, I was just no, going to do that no. one. Because, <laughs> hey, they are. They're going to be some goodies. There's going to be incentives. There's going to be a lot, of cool, a lot of cool stuff going on. I had a good time with you this week, my man. You got, I had a few, a good, you got a future in this business. Oh, I appreciate it, Arn. And, uh, man, I'm just lucky to be able to walk through your history with you and do this week in and week out. And uh, check us out, ad-free shows. Arn and I are going to do some fun bonus stuff and each and every month over there, too. I want you guys to be a part of it. But right now, it's time to close it down. We'll be back, like I said, next week, all things September 1990. On behalf of the enforcer, Arn Anderson, This is Paul Bromwell, and you've been listening to Arn.